Let's take a look at a brief report. Unexpected storms in some parts and droughts in others, the impacts of climate change can be seen all over South Asia. Chennai, India's sixth largest city, gives us a sense of how dire the situation truly is. Home to more than 9 million people, the city is running out of water. But Chennai might not be the only city to face this crisis. As water security in this region is expected to worsen, it's feared that many more areas will be critically affected. A comprehensive study of the Himalayan range, which passes through India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, China, Bhutan and Nepal, shows that the glaciers are dangerously receding. Some 800 million people depend on the flow of water from Himalayan range for irrigation, hydropower and drinking water. Another report warns that if governments do not make substantial cuts to fossil fuel emissions by 2100, the Himalayas could lose 66% of their ice. If everyone doesn't soon join hands to fight climate change, this region and the world at large will be confronted with an irreversible disaster. Uh, Sushmita, going back to you and uh, 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 putting the last question to you here, what do you think needs to be done in the future to make sure that all the problems we've been talking about, they are addressed in a more uh, alarmist manner, they are address, uh, addressed with much more vigor than they were before? Uh, see, uh, what I would like to suggest that, you know, um, CAC, we always promote that decentralized water treatment and wastewater treatment systems. So we say that why don't you involve the communities so we say more of community involvement more of decentralized technologies more of water conservation preservation and conservation of water urban water bodies and groundwater and also uh, i would like to mention that there is no dearth of acts and laws for the preservation and conservation of our groundwater or water bodies, but implementation is where we are lacking. Right. So uh, we actually hope that implementation and the monitoring become strong enough so that the city, along with its decentralized technologies, become uh, water smart cities. Right. And on that note, thank you so much, Ms. Sushmita Aseguta, for joining us and to us. We're also now joined by Mr. Devinder Sharma, who's an economist, joining us from Chandigarh. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sharma, for joining us. Now, Mr. Sharma, when we talk about South Asia, we know that there is rapid development and growth. India and China, the largest economies in the world, they are growing rapidly. Now, with that capitalist model, there also comes many issues, which is greater gra gas emissions, greater greater uh, uh, usage of resources in a more aggressive way. How do you see that going hand in hand? And how do you see that uh, with development, climate change also needs to be tackled? Well, I think you've made a very valid point uh, because every time there is a talk of uh, uh, protecting the world from climate change uh, internationally, whether it's the Paris Convention or whether it is uh, talks elsewhere in the region. The fact of the matter is this aspect of uh, capitalism being the sole factor or the primary factor which drives uh, this climate change is often ignored. I've often said that, uh, you know, unless we bring about a change in the economic reforms or bring about a, ch a radical change in the economic model uh, that is governing the world, we will not be able to bring about any change, significant change as far as climate change is concerned. Right. So unless unless we run down that system which which is built on uh, you know increasing GDP, economic growth, uh, and the and the race towards uh, you know reaching that level uh, or crossing that level Rubicon, I don't think we will be able to to really bring about a change. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, is apparent if you look at both China and India. Uh, we are into environmental crisis. China is uh, now realized that it's a uh, very high rate of economic growth in the previous decade has uh, has had negative consequences as far as environment is concerned. And it Mr. Sharma, on that people. point, in 2018, amidst all of this conversation about climate change, amidst all the smog, uh, air quality uh, indexes coming out and the pollution 
that was evident and visible, there was a rise in emissions. For China, it was 4.7%, and for India, it was 6.3%. So with all of this talk, there doesn't seem to be any political will to actually bring about a meaningful change. You're so right. Uh, you know, uh, there have been cases when we have seen uh, in in Beijing, in China, uh, the, the huge LED screens were put up, uh, which uh, were to... to screen uh, the sunrise and the sunset because people won't be able to see sunrise and sunset. And then there have been talk, uh, in, whether in Beijing and then also in Delhi, that we need to have exhaust fans put up, huge exhaust fans put up, uh, so that you can, uh, you know, take out the bad air uh, or the polluted air. Now, these are not the kind of remedial measures uh, that we need to seek. And the pollution being at peak in India is the one country where pollution is rapidly growing. And uh, whether it's New, New Delhi, uh, and if you look at the globally 21 cities, majority of them are in Asia, and um, uh, most of these cities are in India. And that tells you that India will have to set its house in order. And uh, primarily, it will, unless it will make an effort to move away from that economic design, which is exhibiting the exploitation of natural resources, and adding on to climate change and adding on to, uh, you know, uh, disruptions like uh, like the water crisis that uh, India faces at the present, right. I don't think we will be able to get out of that. Uh, right. And Mr. Sharma, that's a key point that I do want to come back to. Uh, Dr. Abbas, falling from everything that we've been talking about, uh, from, from a developmental point of view and with the population expected to increase in this region, how do you think uh, governments will have to cope with the changing dynamics? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, th there are quite a few things that you learn from politicians. Uh, I, I was uh, pretty excited to learn of quite a few things from Minister Zartaj Gul about the, the, the efforts of the government uh, in the arena of climate change. But at the same time, there are other things. Like the government of Pakistan is investing more in producing more greenhouse gases in coal-fired power plants today then it is uh, the, the, then the entire budget of the Ministry of Climate Change. Then again, the government is talking about planting more trees to clean air and all the environmental benefits from it. But again, the, 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 the module or methodology of the government is such that they are pushing the things there they, where they need to be pulled. You know, the simultaneously government is still implementing on the plans which are choking our rivers more than before, rather than letting the rivers flow. Because when the, once these rivers were flowing freely, their corridors were full of forests. If you let the river flow, it will, it will regenerate its own forests. And you don't have to put that effort manually in putting the trees here and there. So that is the kind of synergistic policies that government should adopt, where they should let their rivers flow, they should manage their aquifers, they should manage their wetlands, they should manage their existing forests, and they should rehabilitate the areas where the nature had already provided forests. So that is the kind of policy that the government should be following. You know, again, I, I agree with Mr. Sharma that it is the, it is the economic engine that actually uh, decides whether you are going green or you are, you are combating with climate change. Now, for example, on, on the water economy side, all the water economy, economy engines that, that are followed in Pakistan are actually only two engines. One is hydropower and the other is uh, agriculture. And both are wasting water and choking the rivers and destroying our, uh, our, our climate. Whereas there are so many other uh, better ways of uh, running the water economy, like intrinsic value of water, like navigation. Dr. Abbas, let me uh, ask like, you this. Uh, With the purpose of trying to have greater development, greater growth of the economy, do you think ever that can be reconciled with these green policies? I mean, the government might have great intentions, but at the end of the day, if the priority is to expand the economy or to have a, a greater, a larger uh, development urban centers here, do you think they can ever uh, work on climate change in a meaningful way? Actually, actually, this, this, this is a big myth. Uh, among many people that they think that in order to make progress, we have to destroy our climate. We have to destroy our environment. That is, that is a very uh, wrong notion because in the last at least 60 to 70 years, the world has learned a lot how to create green sustainable economies, how to create solutions which are synergistic. 
Now, right. for example, I tell you there is an opportunity in climate change. Climate change is not a curse for us. It's an opportunity. Climate change means higher temperatures. Higher temperatures mean more energy in the air, more energy of the sun. Instead of then investing on solar power, we are investing on coal power. Instead of letting our rivers flow, we are choking them further. Now, flowing rivers will produce cleaner water. Right. Flowing rivers will... And Dr. Abbas, that's a very, very Flowing important point that you highlighted here, that it is possible to create sustainable and successful economies. Uh, Mr. Sharma, on uh, an Indian perspective, we have the BJP back in power and in their 2000, uh, 2019 manifesto mandate, they also mentioned climate change. Do you think uh, climate change is becoming a priority for the government there in India? Well, uh, before I answer that, that uh, I, I agree with uh, my co-panelist uh, when he said that uh, the the definition of development actually has to change. You know, the different when I say the, when you say development and uh, everyone is uh, sold out to development, the fact of the matter is, what is the use of the development which benefits only one percent of the population? Well, it's globally, nationally, or regionally, we have seen, you know, money concentrating in the hands of just 1% of the population. If you right. look at India, 1% person, person population holds wealth, which is equal to, say, 73% uh, wealth in India. So the, that's not the kind of development uh, model that the world needs anymore. And I, I also share with you, uh, recently Nobel laureate uh, Joseph Stiglitz has come out with a series of articles where he has said, neoliberalism is dead and buried. Is as clear as that. I have read Paul Krugman. Paul Krugman is saying that the that the policy to to go for labor reforms and the policy to go for cutting down on corporate taxes is has failed in America. Now, if it has failed in America, in, why should India be blindly following it? Why should Pakistan be following it? Why but that, but then following? the rhetoric there as well is that these developed nations have got into that point where they can use it as a luxury and say that okay, now we're going to go green. These developing nations are still in that. That process and the, is, hence they get to use that as an excuse to have these uh, f uh, policies that are not friendly to the environment. Dr. Abbas, so I'll, uh, uh, the show with you, last question to you. How do you see uh, the future here and do you think that it's optimistic in this region when it comes to climate change and trying to mitigate it? I think we should be very optimistic for two reasons. One, that climate change brings us more energy and with more energy we can do a lot more things. And, and with more energy comes more water. So we will have more energy and more water and then we can do a lot more. Then the second thing which is more than ever before is the knowledge base. You were talking about the, the, the countries which made progress by destroying their environment and now they can talk about climate and everything. That's right. But actually those countries when they were making progress, the knowledge base which is available today was much smaller. Like the knowledge base of 1960s produced a black and white TV. Knowledge base of today is producing smart TVs. So that's the kind of knowledge base that we have today in order to move forward. That knowledge base was not there with those countries. Today is the time we can leapfrog and, and we can adopt the latest methodologies and latest knowledge at hand and then make our progress with that big wealth of knowledge. So if we adopt the latest knowledge, if we adopt the latest techniques, we don't have to reinvent the wheels and we don't have to repeat the mistakes of uh, the developed nations. They made many mistakes in the process and like when telephone was replaced by from copper wire to fiber optics, those countries which had not laid copper wire, they directly laid fiber optics. Mm. They did not have to lay copper wire first and followed by uh, fiber optics. So if we did not lay copper wire before, Today, we can right away buy the fiber optics and lay it down for our right. environmental policies and for our de developmental right. goals. We should be able to learn from experiences and case studies before our, as opposed to trying to repeat the same mistakes. On that point, thank you so much, Dr. Hassan Abbas, for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Devinder Sharma, for joining us. Thank you for watching In This Special. We will see you again tomorrow with more stories. Till then, goodbye and take care.